Hi, everyone. Welcome to our session, Not Everything is About Mass, Mobility that I use for research, advocacy, and planning. So we've been hearing about travel information for the last one and a half day. Now we'll be discussing about the other use of uh, data standard. Uh, so with us today, we have William from University of Toronto. We have uh, Matthew De Fontana, the streamer, and we have Ritesh Warand from IBI Group. I will let themselves uh, present who they are. Um, so let's do um, a quick round of introduction. So first of all, I am Elizabeth, the Deputy Executive Director at Mobility Data. I'm based in Montreal. I'm a mobility enthusiast since forever, but really looking forward how we can uh, make mobility sustainable, but also equitable and accessible. And I speak French, English, and Spanish. So, Willem? Uh, hi, I'm Willem. I'm uh, a postdoc fellow at the University of Toronto's Transit Analytics Lab, uh, where I do research that broadly falls under, I'll talk about it, but broadly falls under performance analysis of transit systems. Um, I uh, speak English in this order, English, Dutch, and French. Um, and uh, yeah, well, I'll, I'll leave it there. Talk a little bit more later. Cool. Hey, everyone. I'm Matt Fontana. I'm from Streamer. Uh, I'm head of ecosystem there. Uh, what that means is it's kind of like a head of growth role. It's like the interface layer between the projects and the uh, developers that want to use the, the Streamer technology. Uh, I help them with that. And uh, yeah, I have a technical background, electrical power engineer back in the day, and then uh, a lot of uh, entrepreneuring and, and developing in the middle, and yeah, somehow somehow here. But uh, yeah, very happy to be here, and, and uh, yeah, I'll pass it on. Hi, I'm Ritesh Farade. I'm a director at IBI. Um, we are a design and technology company that works a lot in the transit space. Uh, I lead our transit data team that works with agencies, mostly in North America, on passenger information and analytics projects. Thank you very much. So each of them have a presentation, uh, but please, uh, we're in a, in a small group. We can ask questions whenever you have a question um, at the end of each session. So it's time to get started. Um, we'll start with you, William. So uh, take the mic back. Yeah, I'm going to stand up, too. Might as well. Um, yeah, here's the little little deets. I love a good data set. Um, I worked, a little bit of trivia, I worked as a rail traffic controller, and uh, you may or may not know who Andrew Fung is or the show Kim's Convenience, but I've done improv with him uh, before he was semi-famous. Um, I, did, I did improv with him. Um, and maybe in the spirit of, of improv, there's a, we should do like a really simple improv warm-up to get started, which is that everybody just takes a deep breath and then lowers their expectations. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, all right. <laughs> great. great. Um, so I, I work at the Transit Analytics Lab um, just to give a pitch for them. Uh, it's part of the Civil and Mineral uh, Engineering Department in the University of Toronto, part of the Transportation Research Institute there, now called Mobility Network. Um, the goal for TAL is to really bring transit researchers, uh, social, uh, social science researchers, technology researchers, agencies, the public sector, consultants and specialists kind of all together um, to do transit analytics, advanced analytics, transfer some of that information to, uh, to industry, and to work on st uh, standard development and integration, which is part of the reason why uh, I, was, I was able to come, which is great. For myself, I, I do research that falls under a huge umbrella of, of different things. As I mentioned, performance analysis of, or, of urban transit systems. Um, in three broad categories, I, I do research about the current system state, um, including access and accessibility, which I will talk much more about, um, and has been sort of a, a recurring theme throughout, <laughs> throughout the last couple of days. Uh, reliability, um, you know, where, where there isn't current system state, we do some modeling and prediction, mathematical modeling, simulation modeling, some machine learning work. Um, and then I use scare quotes for emerging technologies, because some of these are sort of what's old is new again. Um, but I've done work with demand responsive transit, um, sort of the impacts of battery electric buses, um, and, uh, and new data standards, which is why I'm here. And there's been a growing interest that I've had about some of the impacts of these performance measures and the decisions that people make with these performance measures um, across populations and the equity of that. But today, um, so if you have any questions about any of the things you just saw on 
this sort of uh, three by three grid of, of things, feel free to come and ask me. Literally everything I ever research touches mobility data in some way, requires mobility data in various forms, um, and has you know, had different levels of frustration or, or problems encountered with mobility data. So uh, if you're interested in any of these topics, we can talk after. But I'm gonna talk about transit access um, and specifically equity. I hope people have, or I don't know how many people attended the, uh, the Global South session at the very beginning of the, okay, so a mix. Um, but here's my little elevator pitch for, for access. It's a, uh, it is a performance measure of a transit system and it measures the sort of the potential you have to, to do things and to, and to reach destinations. There's sort of two broad flavors of access. The one we no normally talk about, um, I call cumulative measures. So uh, in this case, you're counting up all the blue boxes that you can reach, say, in 30 minutes or 50 minutes or whatever time you want to choose, and that's like your, your score for that, for that origin point in the circle. But you can also flip it on its head, and you can say, um, what is the travel time to the closest McDonald's or the closest grocery store or the closest hospital, um, and, and get a measure from that, or the third closest if you need some, some sense of variety. Um, and so it's important to sort of understand that there's these two um, sometimes called primal and dual ways of of looking at access, and um, in some cases, one is more appropriate than the other. Um, it's great to be able to measure this, um, but there's also growing evidence, perhaps it's intuitive, but there's some good evidence that uh, access is important, that um, the higher your level of transit access to destinations, uh, the, the higher you, so there's general growing trend, the higher you participate in society, the more trips you make, the more things you go out and do. Um, and this is a study using the uh, using data from the city of Toronto, or from the whole Toronto region, the Transportation Tomorrow Survey. So they looked at the level of access and the amount of activity participation that you get. So it's certainly a, an important metric um, to, to measure for a transit system. So I wanted to talk about a project, um, a sort of research consulting project that myself and some folks from the University of Toronto, University of Toronto Scarborough, University of Texas at Austin and the University of Vermont all did with Transit Center. Transit Center is a US-based uh, transit advocacy organization. And they had us, we basically developed a, a huge uh, data set over time of different accessibility measures um, in seven different US cities. Um, but to do this kind of accessibility calculation, um, it's a nice simple number you get at the end, but it does require a fair bit of, of data coordination that goes on. Um, so obviously to, know what you want to reach, you need sets of destinations. And we weren't happy with just looking at jobs or looking at population. Um, we wanted to look at grocery stores, so we got data sets from SNAP retailers in the States, food stamp programs. We used OpenStreetMap for things we couldn't find data for elsewhere, official data sources such as park space, for example. Um, and then we also got uh, other government sources for, um, for locations of uh, education institutions and, uh, and urgent care facilities. Uh, and then you need some way to figure out the travel times. So you need to generate a travel time matrix from point A to point B. We used Open Trip Planner. I wish we had started this two years later and I would have probably used um, R in some way or another. Um, we also bought some data from Esri to look at congested travel times by car so that we could compare transit and car travel in these various places. And then there was also an interest to look at um, fares and what the effect of the cost of the transit trip had on your ability to access destinations. Because in some cases, you, know, you could get from point A to point B in 30 minutes or 90 minutes, but it was prohibitively expensive potentially for you. And so we wanted to basically create a fare matrix. Um, and to do that, we had to go in and assemble all of the different fare rules for all of the different agencies we looked at into a database and we built a calculator for that as well. And then once you have the scores, then you can see how those scores are distributed across populations of various population groups, such as low income or different race categories or, um, or you know, single mothers, for example, and you can see how that, whether there's gaps between the access scores for these different groups as well. Just as sort of a summary, we looked at, so the top graph shows, so here's the seven regions, New York, LA, Chicago, Philadelphia, San Francisco, Washington, and Boston. Um, this is the number of trips we had to consider per region to, to check fares and, and check travel times, 47 million for New York. It's a bit of an outlier. Um, but the big thing was that we had to pull scheduled data and, fare, and go and find fare information for sometimes 34 or 35 different 
transit agencies um, or transit providers, in some, in some cases they were private, um, or ferry companies, for example, even, and, and assemble them into a, a big giant OTP graph that we could then use to calculate these travel times. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the fare calculator part, because there's been lots of discussion about fares, um, and fares V2 being a very uh, new thing that, that um, has been discussed and announced and passed, I believe, right, uh, recently. Um, so the trouble we ran into was, was that we needed to find some way to separate the, uh, the, the, the actual infrastructure or where people could transfer from the, from the, uh, from the, the data set, and that wasn't possible with V1. And we started this in 2020, and so V2 wasn't quite um, mature enough for that yet. So the system that we developed is we would take an uh, open trip planner itinerary. You see three legs there at the top. Um, and then using the fare rules, a hierarchy of fare rules that starts from the basically the stop level and then area, route, region, system um, level, we would keep track of the permissions that you had throughout the itinerary. So you. You'd start your trip and you'd get two hours, but only one transfer, let's say. There's all sorts of arcane weird rules, transfer rules that people have. Um, and so you would keep track of that and decrement your transfer counter when you made a transfer and then you know, decrement the time when you, made, when, you, uh, when you used up some time to travel from one leg to another. And then you could keep track of the permissions that you had, effectively something like a smart card would keep track of, um, and then add that all together at the end to get the total fare for that. And there's a paper that looks specifically at um, the fare calculator and, uh, and its resulting analysis. So there's basically the quote from the paper that uh, was the reason that we didn't, uh, we didn't use. We had to kind of develop our own standard. Um, so then there's the fun part. So we looked at nine different destination types. So low income jobs, jobs, as I mentioned, park space, all these different types. Um, we used two to three measurement options for each. So for example, you could look at jobs you could reach in 45 minutes or 60 minutes or 30 minutes. Um, we did this analysis where we looked and said, uh, what happens if you have a limit on the amount of fare you can spend? And we also looked at saying, let's remove all the expensive commuter rail routes and then also see if you can reach a destination. So we actually created two fare matrices for each scenario. We looked at two to three times of day, so a morning peak, an evening, um, and a Saturday. We looked at the auto. And then each of these, we did it at the block group level in the US, so uh, these regions had three to 14,000 different block groups. Um, we've done it over 14 months now. We're still sort of continually updating it as we go. So we, we started this project in uh, March of 2020, and it was gonna be a, initially gonna be a static, um, a static data set. Uh, and then we thought, well, why don't we just check every month and rerun it? Uh, simple, sounds simple, but we start, start every month, check it, and see how the, how the changes due to the pandemic in the, in the level of service is affecting people differently um, and across seven regions. So uh, roughly 124 million data points that we wanted to then try to let users visualize and understand because it's a transit advocacy group. They wanted people to be able to use the data to then um, you know, advocate to transit agencies for certain changes. So we built the Transit Center Equity Dashboard. Um, dashboard.transitcenter.org if you're interested. Uh, and here you can see a fairly sort of simple input menu. You can choose all the different parameters that you might want for any sort of type of measure. There's a timeline on the bottom so you can jump from through different days and see how the picture of the city changes for a given metric as well. Um, so that's sort of the map view that shows map level accessibility. And then we also created these summary stories, we call them, so population weighted totals of of these counts. Um, this is in, these are all examples from DC, from Washington DC. Um, so at the top we did a really simple measure of, we called it transit service intensity, but like the amount of transit that was coming by, which is sort of the average trips in a 24 hour period per hour um, that go by, go near or through a certain zone. And you can see, you know, obviously the service being cut during the pandemic and then not fully restored uh, since then. And you can see population weighted, um, the differences between different groups. If you go on the website and look on this, you can click on different dates and it'll change, the, uh, it'll change the bar graph on the right. And so you can sort of see how the ordinal effect of it changes as well. And then you can see how that translates to changes in accessibility, so, or in access. So you can see here a large gap in, in DC between the level of access for uh, white people versus basically everybody else. And you can see how that gap has maybe grown or shrunk um, depending on how 
the, the decisions that they made to, to cut service in various areas. Uh, top right, you can see a direct comparison of how long it takes to get by transit on average to a certain destination versus, versus the car. So that sort of stark difference between the, uh, the car and transit travel time in pretty much all of the American cities. Um, so I mentioned that we, we looked at fare limited, so we basically said um, if you have not only a time barrier for how far you can go, but you have a fare barrier for how far you can go or, or how many things you can reach, um, we came up with a measure which we're calling fare disparity, which is just the ratio of what you can reach versus not as a percentage. And you can see a graph, so you can also on the website see a graph of uh, these different populations and the differences between them. But you can also put this disparity on a map level, so you can start to see the effects of uh, in this case, commuter rail and the price of commuter rail on even just different boroughs. So darker in this map is a higher disparity, which means there's a bigger difference in what you can reach if you have unlimited budget versus you have a budget. So Queens, for example, um, there's quite a bit of disparity because they're right next to a lot of commuter rail. Uh, Brooklyn is uh, much less and Staten Island, again, much less. Um, so there's, there's some sort of stark differences that you can then turn around and go to the transit agency and the planning and policy people and, and sort of point out these, these gaps. And you can see that there's a lot of variation in color. I didn't put the LA map, but Los Angeles is much less. Um, and there's a few ways that we're sort of extending or, or trying to add to this kind of thing and, and teach transit agencies to, um, to do some of this themselves. Uh, so we worked a little bit with Metrolinx to develop a way to take, in this particular case, to take outputs from your transportation model so um, whether you trust the model or not, people use models to make those decisions. Um, so you could take two scenarios, for example, uh, let's say in Toronto, a, a scenario with the Ontario line and a scenario without the Ontario line. Um, and then you can compare how these various um, four key outcomes change across different populations uh, as well. Um, and this is something we're working on turning into uh, sort of a guide slash set of Python notebooks that you can do with an open source example with open data that you can you know, learn how to do this either as a transit agency or we can teach a transit agency how to do this so that they can start including these kinds of metrics and measures in business cases, which um, at least in Canada doesn't happen currently um, at all. And this is all part of the mobilizing justice, uh, which I'll give a pitch to as well, which is a... Uh, University of Toronto, uh, Scarborough, big research project on trying to, again, build data standards and build research standards for um, uh, justice-based mobility generally. Um, and just, yeah, quick quick sort of thing of the uh, kind of insights you can get from, from these analyses or from these comparative analyses. So again, this is uh, using the, the, the 2041 predicted models for um, the inclusion of a transit project called the Ontario Line and not. You can see how each station area um, changes in terms of we're looking at low income percentage as well as uh, the number of people in low income um, households as well. So you can see that there's disparity between station locations, which is perhaps evident, but when it's all summed up here together in a line, it has presents a much uh, more direct picture. Um, and then again, you can take the number of, or uh, the amount of access that's granted, so this is access to jobs and how that changes over different categories, and it might be different, for example, than the amount of trips that get induced by a model, um, and the amount of trips induced by a model might be a good indicator of how much benefit the model's actually providing to make people switch to transit, um, at least mathematically. And finally, um, I just wanted to make the point that, you know, with a lot of, a lot of this open data, and as the open data gets better and better, um, you can start to try to assemble these, um, I'm calling them placemats, but these graphics or these things that you can, you can add a lot of nuance to a conversation without overwhelming people with the level of data. Um, so I'm very interested in trying to see, uh, find ways to produce something like this that you could sit in front of a city councillor, for example, or you could put in front of a, a decision maker, and they could digest it and learn a lot about what's going on um, very quickly and then use that, that sort of visual intuition to, uh, to help influence their decisions. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I feel like I need a moment to process all the graphs <laughs> and the information you shared. Um, so I guess that if you wanna have more information about um, 
about that, we can reach out to you. Yeah, absolutely. Any, anything you saw that you were curious about, I'd be happy to talk more of. Thank you very much. And yeah, literally everything I do touches mobility data, so it really is. I can answer some questions if people want something specific, but we can wait also. Question moment, sure. Yes, uh, it's very inter interesting. I was wondering what kind of data model you were using for describing the passenger trip, because w when you have GTFS input, that's the full view of the network, but, but what the passenger is doing is just using a subpart of, of a vehicle, drone A, make a connection, maybe. So, so it's, it's not the same data model that you, you have from GTFS. And I'm also asking the question, because we had exactly the same problem uh, need in, in, in Europe, and in Transmodel, we, we did design a specific sub-model for passenger trips. Uh, so did you do it? Did you do your own data model for it, or did you get inspired from for, releasing? For which part? For the for the fares part, or no, no, no not for the fares part. Uh, mainly for, for for the for the trip description for really really passenger trips. So when when, when you talk about accessibility, oh, is, is uh, in the in I think I have the oh no I can't do it now the 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 the, the changes in travel times and and trips yeah yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. That all comes from a transportation model. So it all comes from a, uh, I mean, it's an ME model at the end of the day, um, but the trip lengths and average trip lengths and all of that and the distributions for the accessibility all come from, um, yeah, basically a travel matrix that gets produced by, by a, a, a model, which is not ideal, <laughs> but um, certainly something that gets used a lot. So we thought we'd take advantage of the existing oh, of, of that data, system. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Heng Chon from WRI. I have two questions, one low level and one higher level. Uh, <laughs> the, the low level one is uh, how do you account for uh, like congestions or capacities of the bus, bus? Because I don't know which versions of GTFs you're using uh, in order to uh, calculate these access map. And that's low level question. The higher level question is, um, We've been, at least in, in my networks of people, everybody's doing access, like all across the globe, uh, in, in my network as in urban planners. So I'm wondering about, I mean, those are like researcher academics and NGOs. Uh, what does it mean in terms of translating that into policy? Uh, where are the transit agency in, ter uh, in terms of using this access matrix? Because it's include more of a land use component it, it's implicitly because you're... Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So to answer your question about uh, congestion and crowding, we didn't take into account congestion and crowding. <laughs> Simple as that. Um, or, you know, there's lots of different passenger experience measures that would be nice to include. Um, and maybe to sort of tie it in with the answer to the bigger question, um, I think there's lots of, of researchers, a few transit planning consultants um, that are starting to use this, and it is starting to get used, but I will say... Um, at least, at least in the US, there's not enough uptake to the point where an advocacy agency is willing to spend a fair amount of money to try and produce these measures so that they can then be used, hopefully by transit agencies, but also by, by local advocates. And Transit Center did work a lot with local on the ground uh, advocacy groups to, to learn a bit about what they wanted to see, which is why you know, there is some, some fair modeling and stuff as well. So um, yeah, clearly there's still some hand-holding that needs to be done to, to produce these um, for, for people to use instead of letting them do it themselves. Great. I'm curious if you looked at, uh, if you compared uh, trans or destination accessibility versus estimated ridership um, in a demand model as, you know, as a metric in planning. Um, do you find, like, I think there's advantages to the, the destination accessibility and that you're, you're answering questions about, well, who does this benefit? And it's a little bit less black box. I guess that's my opinion, but I know that there's a lot of existing practice around using uh, uh, demand models. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a bit of a philosophical argument you can make of, um, this is something that uh, me and one of the researchers have had a bit of a back and forth with, Jer with planning consultant Jared Walker about, and he loves access, which is great. Um, it shows potential. Um, but one of the questions that really I think is still fairly unanswered is how does how truly does your access translate into actual use? Um, and his argument is that we shouldn't be doing any rider behavior stuff at all, that we should just be showing, you know, here's what you could do, and that's good, and it's better than what you had before. Um, but it's also, I think, important to know, like, 
you know, if you increase something by however many jobs, how does that really change behavior? Um, I think there are better ways to do it than, than it's done in a transportation model. Um, but I think there is certainly a, like a rider and use component that uh, I think needs to be part of the conversation. Yeah. yeah, and my question is mainly in that sense. Um, so in Latin America, we have a big issue of safety inside the buses and specifically for women. So, and that's a big barrier for uh, ridership in our region. So I was wondering if you thought about including some safety perception or safety like actual um, indicator in some of the equity indicators. Yeah, certainly uh, that would be fantastic. There's a lot of experience related indicators that um, we basically just completely ignore. Um, yeah, specifically ones that are stratified across gender or race uh, or age um, or income even. So uh, those would be really good to include. We, you know, it basically you're just adding layers of, of potential barriers or, or changes in, in, you know, the amount of access that you can have. And of course that needs more data and you need more information about how that, how that happens. But those would all be extremely good things to include um, and, you know, this is a good start, and I would love to build on top of it for sure um, to, to be able to do that. Even one really simple example is reliability. So, you know, we use, we use what R5, or in this case, Open Trip Planner, tells us it's going to take. There's been some really good research recently showing, um, showing that this may not actually be true, and your, your isochrone or what you can reach in a given, you know, with a bit of a statistical analysis of it is much smaller than what it suggests you can reach because you might miss a transfer or maybe you can make a transfer you couldn't otherwise make. So all of that experience stuff needs to be added into this as well. And um, I'll do the academic cop out and say future work. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. This is uh, quite interesting and I've been following Transit Center's work so it's good to know what happened behind the scenes. Um, I'm curious if uh, this has, uh, predictive capabilities as well, right? If new transit lines are being developed, like the the Eglinton line in Toronto that's being developed, do does this tool have capacity to actually uh, think about those uh, lines, if they will actually be effective? Yeah, that's a, a solid question. There's, <laughs> there's a few ways to answer it. Um, one is, I mean, the, a transportation model is some sort of prediction. Um, we are also, it's great people are, are bringing up things that we've thought of as, as future research projects, so it's great. Um, another one is to look a little bit at making some better predictions about how, even or simpler predictions about how adding to a network might change access. The real simple thing that we'd like to do next is develop a tool that lets you, you so you can use a, a wonderful maybe open source GTFS editor and change, um, change your GTFS feed, add in a line, change your frequencies, um, and then put it back through and see how the equity distribution changes um, based on that. And that's a, that's a really easy way to look at scenarios. It's a really good way for advocacy groups to maybe respond to the idea of cutting a bus route or, or changing service on a bus route. You can say, oh, look, it's gonna primarily lower it for this type of user. Um, and so that type of scenario planning is certainly possible and I really like to work in the present. I try not to work too much in the future. Um, but obviously, you know, there's that debate between fixing what's wrong now versus trying to go to where the ball is being kicked as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Willem. And I think you set up my presentation perfectly. Thank you. So I'm gonna move this out of the way. Um, again, interactive session, let's talk. I don't have too many slides, so I, I want to more start a conversation about um, using GTFS for other things besides passenger information. So quick thing about me, first point, I'm a transit nerd. And I say that because if I wasn't doing data, who knows, I'd be driving buses or I'd be doing transit planning, something in the transit world. Um, I started in architecture, actually designing and building transit stations, then moved into planning. And so planning is near and dear to me. And I keep thinking about how do you use data for planning? How do you plan for the future using some of the data standards that we have? So some of what I'm going to show you is about that. Before that, um, Wanted to put this up, and how many people know the somewhat um, urban legend behind the origin of GTFS? Okay. So, I mean, Aaron was there, a, a few other people are there. Um, 
the, the story goes that um, Google wanted to put transit directions in Google Maps. They went to a number of agencies, and everyone gave them a different format or a different way of structuring things. And so Google being Google said, um, we are not going to deal with all of your data sets. Here is our format. But that format was TriMet. And so they went to TriMet, and, and basically this came from the way TriMet structured its internal representation of transit. I wish they didn't, but we are stuck here. But what's even cooler about this is that it is structured data. It is a, there is a, a way that you present relationships between different things in the transit network. And the cool thing about structured data is that once you have it structured, you can do other things with it. So yes, of course, it did its primary purpose of passenger information. But once you have structured data, you can do other things. You can represent things in the past. You can represent things in the future. And so what I'm going to talk about is scenario planning. And how do you do scenario planning and scenario development using information and using GTFS? So a couple of examples. Um, this is uh, a planning thing by Remix. Um, it's their tool to start seeing, okay, what corridors are we going to be focusing on? What corridors are maybe we, uh, maybe we'll in, improve the travel time um, by maybe doing some interventions like queue jump lanes or transit signal priority. Everything they do gets represented as GTFS. So all these micro changes can be represented in a GTFS file that says, okay, this is what it used to be. And this is what the network can be if we make these interventions. So essentially, if you think about this, this is uh, the result of this is a GTFS new. And that can be used for something else. Another example, and this is from Conveil Analysis. Willem knows this. Um, so Conveil is the company that did a lot of work behind Open Trip Planner. They now have an analysis tool called Conveil Analysis. It does access to opportunities. Same thing. You can put in a GTFS, and it will measure how many jobs or housing or schools or healthcare can you reach within a 30-minute, 60-minute uh, uh, distance. Again, it allows you to figure out whether one network is better than the other. Again, better being in quotes. One network is better than the other because we can reach more opportunities. Um, FTA stops model. Um, how many of you know what FTA stops model is? Okay. In the US, uh, and this is uh, American speaking uh, about US things, um, we don't like to spend money on transit. So you have to justify every investment in transit. One of the ways to do it is to, is to say whether it has a benefit, whether it actually attracts riders, whether it is actually serving a proportion of the rides in a region. The process is so onerous to actually make that calculation. You have to go through a four-step model, a four-step ME model. And you, yes, the Bostons and the New Yorks of the world can do it, but what do you do in Nashville? What do you do in Tampa, like smaller cities? The FTA actually decided, which is the Federal Transit Administration in the US decided, that if you have GTFS, they will accept GTFS as a proper representation of the transit network in a four-step model. So they came up with what became the FTA stops model. And one of the main inputs is GTFS. Again, using GTFS not for its intended purposes, which is passenger information, but using it for essentially demand modeling and answering those questions on whether this network is worth implementing or this change is worth implementing. I'm going to end here, uh, or this is one of the other things, and I'm going to switch to a, a, a few uh, uh, interactive things. Um, I love this diagram because this is a network redesign, a bus network redesign in Baltimore. Um, so Baltimore uh, decided to completely restructure its bus network. And they were trying a lot of bus networks in North America f have been essentially unchanged for the last 50 years, maybe 100 years. They still follow the same patterns where people lived in the 20s and 30s and 40s, and not really how people were, live and work right now. This was an example of trying to completely rethink a transit network. But how do you communicate it? How do you tell people that this is a new network? that this actually is going to feel different or work differently than what you had. One way is they made a map. They made a beautiful map, 
but they made a map. And it is very difficult for the regular lay person to understand, okay, what does this mean for me? Yes, it's, it's pretty. Yes, I can see how I can connect. But what is my experience? And that has then led to some other uses of GTFS. So this is an interactive trip comparison tool, again, created by Conveil, where you have the old network and the new network. And you put in uh, origin and a destination. And what it's doing is basically calculating what is the new pattern? What, what is the journey you would take before? And what is the journey you would take after? The next thing they did is a slightly different way of looking at it is how many access to jobs or opportunities can you get with the network? So I'll just show this. I'm just going to move this origin and destination around. What you're seeing here is that you now have 5% more access to opportunities with the new network than you had with the old. If you were to see in terms of time, this is how many locations you could reach given the new network. Again, a way of representing to people that we are completely, re completely changing your bus network. What does that feel for you? What is the improvement for you? And so you get to do these beautiful interactive maps, but also go into a public meeting and say, OK, put in your home and put in your work. And this is what this new network is going to mean for you. And I'm going to end with this one, Boston. Boston is now doing a, a new bus network redesign. They are completely revamping their bus network. We got called in to help them implement it. And when we went in, I was expecting to get like maps, to get GIS files and shape files and say, OK, go here, implement this. I was surprised that I got this, which is this is a fully interactive map of transit. This is the entire transit network. So if I click a route, what is the new frequency? Where are the new stops? What are the speeds here? What am I going to do in the morning? What, I go what am I going to do in the evening? What is the headway between 7 and 8, 8 and 9, et cetera? This is a way to represent building new things, doing scenario anal planning, saying that, OK, if we change the network, this is how it looks like for the people who ride this bus network. And I found this fascinating because this is all GTFS. Nothing except GTFS. This is just GTFS in the background. And you're using it to communicate something completely different. The planning side of my brain is always fascinated with, OK, now that you have a structured data format, what can you do with it? And so can you do scenario analysis? And that's where you know, we come in. We have tools, and IBI has built open source tools to create GTFS. We did it for passenger information. We did it because we want to do trip planning. But we also run a planning practice, a transit planning practice. And we started using our own tools to create different scenarios. Add a line, remove a line, change a frequency. Um, if there is an ex uh, a local bus route, add an express bus route on top of it and see whether it is any better or not. And so we've been using these tools internally. As of three weeks ago, we decided to make this open. If you're a researcher and you need to create GTFS, not for service, not for uh, passenger information, but just for research purposes or planning purposes or scenario development purposes, talk to us. We'll give you access. And because we think that GTFS is the way to communicate changes in transit to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Questions in the audience? Hi. Actually, it's a question for you both. Uh, one of the things GTFS can do, it's, it's from a, as a developer, I don't think it's a good, efficient idea, but it has the benefits of being there. GTFS can express, being just like a map of relationship between entities, it can express what has happened also. It's, it's a pretty verbose, terribly yes. verbose way to express it. But you can perfectly say that from last year until today, what happened was this, like making a timetable with every day being slightly different and expressing that way. It's, it's wasteful, but it's there. So uh, have you come across people like doing that, expressing it 
as GTFS because yeah, the data is, there, is somewhere. Is there anyone from MBTA here? Boston? Okay, so Boston uh, updates their GTFS very frequently. So is it exactly what happened on a given day? No. Is it a pretty good representation on what they were planning to do on a given day? Yes. Um, I would love to see the GTFS as it happened being created. Uh, it would be fascinating. Like someone does a like write some code to take GTFS real time and then manipulate the GTFS to create basically GTFS as of June 4th. Uh, that would be fun. There, there, there is actually a, a, another a research project at, at was University of Toronto Scarborough. They called it, a PhD student did something he called retro GTFS, which was that he took real time data uh, that he collected and then he sort of put it back on the GTFS feed to get a sense of like, Okay, what was the GTFS? How was the GTFS sort of actually expressed in the, on that given day, and to get some reliability and some understanding? So it's an exact example of that idea. Yeah. Yeah. So my question is, would it be useful, even if it's like technically kind of incorrect? Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, would it be useful? And and the answer is absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it would. It would be. And uh, and I will say, you know, from a research point of view, we we find all sorts of stupid ways to use data that was not intended for, um, and we're proud of it, I guess, in some ways. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that would be a good that would be a good one. Okay, uh, hey everyone, I'm Matt Fontana. I am from the uh, Streamer Project. This is a next generation decentralized uh, real time data infrastructure project. It's a lot of uh, you might need to get used to a lot of buzzwords and a lot of acronyms in this session. I'll try and keep it as as light as I can, but there is. Uh, there is some, some background that we need to uh, go through first. I think I'm a little bit of an outlier in, in the group in that uh, uh, Web3 is not quite uh, well represented in this space just yet, but I think, uh, I think that will change over the next five years and I'd love to kind of introduce everyone to the, to the topic. Uh, so that's how I'll begin. Uh, then I'll talk to the project that I know best, which is the Streamer Network. I'll, uh, I'll give it a hint about what's coming next for us. Uh, then I'll go into uh, crowdsourcing mobility data. Uh, this has come up in this conference already, so I think uh, um, we have a different take on this that I think is quite uh, interesting. Uh, I'll go into how uh, we can leverage mobility data, of course, and uh, then give some corny predictions about the future because everybody loves those. Um, so in 2011, Mark Andreessen uh, famously said that uh, software is going to eat the world. And I, I think 10, 11 years later, we, we kind of have to give him credit. Uh, software has eaten the world. And uh, what I think what will happen over the next 10 years is that crypto will eat software. Um, and mobility as well. <laughs> so uh, we need to get ready for this. Uh, but first, what, is, what do I mean when I, when I say Web3, crypto? Uh, these are very uh, poorly defined uh, terms that people uh, throw around. They're very ambiguous. And the more accurate term, I believe, is crypto economic systems. It's a bit more verbose, but uh, I think it's important to start with a crisp, crisp definition of, of what this is. Uh, so it is the combined use of economics and cryptography to manage the functions of participants using a network with aspects of ma mathematics, game theory, and mechanism design. Um, so a, a great example of a crypto economic system is a Web3 protocol. And a Web3 protocol is something that uh, utilizes three uh, three very important technologies, blockchain, uh, tokens, uh, we can think of this as cryptocurrencies, and uh, smart contracts. So uh, I, I really want to, in this session, uh, explain that there is some innovation in this space. Uh, you may, may have heard uh, everybody ha kind of comes with their own baggage when they hear Bitcoin and, and crypto, and there are a, a lot of... Uh, scams and problems in the industry, but there is also genuine uh, innovation. And I think there's a lot of opportunities for the mobility space here. So Web3 protocols, they usually have a Web2 analog. Um, and it, this, 
I don't particularly love this uh, particular graphic because it's quite competitive and Web3 versus Web2, it's, it's uh, a, a bit too uh, aggressive, but um, this is, Web3 is a different way of doing what has been done in Web2. Uh, I, I like this graphic a little bit more. Uh, it, this shows that uh, uh, we're building protocols, not platforms. So instead of these uh, closed gardens, wa so, excuse me, walled gardens and closed platforms, uh, we're building these protocols that are open source, they're composable, and they work together really well. So uh, we, we work together with uh, other Web3 protocols to create uh, to recreate Web2 uh, with uh, uh, kind of ethical first principles uh, related to being permissionless, trustless, uh, control of your own data and, and things like this. And one last take that I think kind of uh, really drives it home is that uh, in Web1, companies create the content, uh, companies make the money in Web2, uh, we started to create the content and they made the money. In Web3, uh, we're gonna make the content and uh, we're going to have ownership and we're gonna take some upside in, the, in our own data and in, our, in the content that we create. Okay, so what is the streamer network? Uh, so this is a Web3 protocol and it's a decentralized, real-time, uh, publish, subscribe messaging system. So um, it's like a messaging broker, a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, technology, and it's built to distribute and trade the world's live uh, flowing data and uh, be able to monetize and trade it. So uh, perhaps for some context, how does data flow uh, today? Um, oh, these. These icons didn't quite make, <laughs> make it through, but um, uh, typically we have data publishers of some sort, applications, IoT sensors. They're pushing into a, uh, into a company's data center, Amazon, Google, uh, and there's an SLA, a handshake, uh, credit card details, and you have this relationship with the infrastructure provider to uh, provide this data pipeline uh, in return for uh, money or value. And uh, they, they handle this uh, decoupling so that the publishers don't need to make these direct connections with the subscribers. So the subscribers or the listeners, the people that are interested in this data, they just need to connect to this uh, single uh, point, this main uh, data center. Uh, so in this respect, the data kind of, you can imagine it flowing vertically in the internet through these uh, data centers. And, and this kind of has some uh, social problems, has, has some technical problems as well, because this is a central point of failure and it's a political point of failure. It, it's, a, it's a point of censorship for some kinds of data. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so the streamer network is, is quite different in that instead of uh, a data center, um, we have a peer-to-peer -peer network, and that peer-to-peer -peer network is made, uh, is created by the people, and it's for, from uh, the devices that they have in their houses or uh, on them, it might be their mobile phones, a Raspberry Pi device. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's essentially their uh, latent, unused bandwidth. They're contributing it to the network, and uh, with the, the power of uh, the protocol, uh, we're able to utilize this unused uh, bandwidth and, and create infrastructure from this. So instead of uh, credit cards, there is tokens. Instead of SLAs, there are smart contracts. And uh, the data flows uh, th uh, horizontally instead of vertically uh, through uh, the people's network. So this is uh, some pictures of uh, uh, what's called broker nodes in the streamer network, uh, probably from someone's garage. Uh, someone is driving and, well, in the passenger seat rather, and uh, they're running a, a node and uh, helping to, to publish data around the world. And uh, someone has, has uh, hacked together um, from some consumer electronics, uh, a, a Raspberry Pi uh, node based on uh, and can power it very lightly. So uh, whereas data centers are quite uh, power intensive, uh, the streamer nodes are 
you can run them uh, in, in a very light way. So we see this as, as a greener way to, to uh, propagate data around the internet. And if none of that made sense to you, it's really <laughs> complicated and it took me a few years to, to wrap my head around it. It's, uh, we connect real world live data with some crypto magic. Uh, something that's coming next for the for the network is um, our uh, streamer hub, and I, I think this is a <laughs> I, I'm slightly regretting this slide because after coming here, I've realised that this is not entirely true. <laughs> it's a bit more uh, uh, competitive, uh, yeah, a bit more aggressive than I I, I uh, anticipated. Uh, I would like to see more real time open data in the space. Maybe that should be the 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 uh, the slide, but um, I, I think that uh, a lot of these transport hubs they are kind of stuck in in older ways, and uh, real time data availability is is perhaps a, a bit of a problem in this space. As as a casual observer, so far at least, I think that if we can improve the the data availability and especially the real time data availability. Uh, it makes everything uh, so much easier. We, we've talked a lot about uh, the standards, uh, the, the schema of the spec of the data, but uh, if the data is not there uh, or if the data is not timely, uh, then we, we also have a problem. So uh, any steps toward this, I think, is, will be beneficial for the space. And uh, here is a quick uh, teaser picture of what, what would be the hub uh, coming soon. Uh, and uh, I think discoverability of, of data as well is, is I, I think it can be, can be done better and, and also to introduce uh, data sets that are, that are not quite mobility. So uh, weather data and, and power data, uh, the energy sector and the mobility sector I think are, are, are going to merge uh, because of all the EVs coming into the grid. Uh, it, it makes for uh, a, a data scientist um, a dream to have all this disparate data that they can plug together and, and be able to discover uh, these, these kinds of patterns. And we can build, uh, there's been a lot of talk about the, in the conference as well about building a uh, ecosystem of developers around data and I think this could be really uh, done natively on, on a real-time open data hub. Okay, moving into ethically crowdsourcing uh, mobility data. So crowdsourcing as well as, has been another hot topic here. And uh, we have a, a, a different take on, on how, to, how to do this. Uh, one project in our ecosystem called Demo, uh, they are creating a roaming car data mining network. And what this is, is a Raspberry Pi style device. You can think of it as a little computer. Uh, it plugs into the car's OBD port, and uh, and it looks like this, and um, it's able to uh, collect data about the car and uh, propagate that into the network and uh, and uh, share it in terms of um, so there's two kinds of data that it's collecting: open data and and uh, more sensitive data. And I'll get to that in a second, but. Uh, uh, their, their, their point of, um, their, their branding is that your car is a story to tell and it's true that these devices, they're, they're fantastic, they roam around the environment, they're collecting huge amounts of, of data that is public good data that should be shared. Um, so one example is uh, pothole detection, we have traffic reports, uh, slippery road detection, these cars uh, if I go over uh, some black ice, I, sh I should, uh, we have all the pieces, we have all the technology, it's 2022, we should be able to, to tell the car behind us that might be a different uh, manufacturer than us that there is a slippery uh, road ahead. Um, so this is, this is the pattern that they are activating and uh, I'm very excited for uh, them to create this public good data that I think will have a lot of value uh, for all kinds of mobility. And as well as, as the public good data, they're also collecting uh, uh, the more sensitive data. So this is the pay to access data. And we call this, uh, this, ki this kind of pattern a data union. And this is where uh, data that has certain business value 
uh, can be collected and monetized in a very fair and transparent way. So uh, one great example is uh, EV battery usage and degradation data. So this is, uh, this is something that manufacturers are really get excited about, they pay money for, and they are actually uh, selling that data behind your back already. And so uh, this, in this pattern, we, we bring back the data ownership back to the user. And when the data is sold, let's say it's sold for $100, and there are 100 data providers that helped to produce this data set. Each of those data providers uh, automatically, through the power of smart contracts, uh, gets their one hundredth of of that data sale. So it is uh, a very um, it's it's a fair data uh, trade, I suppose, and uh, yeah, all sorts of other kinds of data that they can uh, have uh, ownership for and choose to monetize if they wish. So how do we leverage data in mobility? Um, I, I think um, this is uh, very obvious to begin with, um, uh, better mobility UX, of course. Uh, but we can, of course, also improve decision-making, uh, policy-making, uh, investment planning, and reducing business risk. So this is where, uh, if the data is uh, adding business value, then uh, we think that the individuals should see upside in this. And then uh, perhaps a, a slightly different take is how do we leverage crypto in, in mobility? And I think that there's a real opportunity here in the green transition especially to incentivize uh, uh, people to, to take the greener route to work. So I think this will be uh, very, uh, very um, uh, disruptive in the space over the next five, 10 years. And lastly, my corny predictions, as promised, uh, mobility will be a crypto economic system, um, maybe, maybe in the next 10 years, let's say. Um, I think this is such, crypto is, uh, I've drunk the Kool-Aid, so you know, perhaps I'm just crazy, but uh, uh, I, I believe that it's such a powerful tool for policy makers and it's such a, it's, uh, such a useful thing uh, in the space that I think it will eventually uh, find its way uh, into eating mobility. Um, Second prediction is that individuals will participate and own the mobility data and the mobility infrastructure. I think this, uh, this is very clear. The regulatory direction is also very clear on this, that uh, people are, are kind of waking up to their data rights. And, and this, is, this is a good thing. And it leads me to my third prediction, which is that these new uh, value propositions, improved experiences, and new revenue models will emerge uh, from this decentralization of data ownership, bringing it back uh, to the individual. Okay, uh, that's all, thank you very much. I have one question. Sure. How do you ensure the privacy of data, privacy of users? Uh, for this, there is end-to-end -end encryption, uh, so the data that flows through the network, it is signed, cryptographically signed at the source, and it flows through the network uh, entirely encrypted and only available to subscribers that you choose to have access to. So the security model of the streamer network is uh, essentially the, the security guarantees of the underlying blockchain technology itself, which is very secure. Yeah. That's maybe the solution for the GBFS, you know, Licensing question and question in the room. Um, that's just a comment. Uh, I actually attended a streamer network meetup five years ago in Helsinki. Oh wow! Yeah, so I'm <laughs> kind of surprised to see it in this context. This was an Ethereum meetup. Ah, fantastic! Yes. Well, uh, so nice, so nice of you to come and uh, yeah, we should catch up later. This is great. Yeah. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure having the three of you with us for the panel about what can we do with data except mass. So thank you very much. Uh, <laughs>